Welcome to City Soul Ministries. I'm uh, Jerry Dotson. Pastor Luke is still on vacation, so I'll be bringing a message this morning. Open your Bibles, if you will, to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. And then once you find that, hold that spot and flip back to the book of Jude. If you remember the last time we looked at Jude, Jude has only one chapter, and it's a letter that was written by Jesus' half-brother Jude. Uh, It's a letter about false teachers and apostasy. And you might remember that uh, Jude tends to use triads in his writing, and uh, that's groups of three. And this morning we're going to look at two of those triads as he tells us uh, some things about false teachers. Starting in Jude verse 4, it says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Jude tells us that false teachers are, number one, ungodly. Number two, that they pervert the grace of God for their own fleshly desires And number three, they deny the person of Jesus Christ. So first, false teachers are ungodly people. This really gets to the root of apostasy and the people that promote it. Uh, Another way to look at this might be to ask, what makes a bad person a bad person? And uh, what's the difference between a bad person and a good person? So let's look at what the Bible means when it calls someone ungodly. The Greek word that's used here is asabea, and it's a Greek term, it was a legal term for the crime uh, of irreverence towards the state gods. So in that one sense, it means irreverence or impiety, uh, to, to not revere. It also means wicked which is really interesting because we're going to see that irreverence irreverence to the true God is what brings wickedness into a person's life. And what we're talking about is a hard-hearted resolution to reject God. So before we come down too hard on that, let's remember that every single one of us started in that condition. We were all born sinners. And we all began life as ungodly people. And Romans 5, 6 says, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for us, for the ungodly. We all began life as ungodly people, and it's only by belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and his works in us that we're able to, to be godly and to not long, no longer be ungodly people. So that's what makes a bad person a bad person is a uh, refusal to believe in the true God. And the only thing that makes us good is God's working in us. This term uh, refused, refers to people who continually refuse to acknowledge God. Uh, Romans chapter 1 lays this out for us. And beginning in verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So the first point is that God pours his wrath out on ungodly people. And we will see what that looks like. But first, uh, we see that ungodly people suppress the truth about God. They try to ensure that people do not know the truth So false teachers teach, but what they teach is not the true gospel. Their goal is to prevent people from hearing the truth. And we know that faith comes through hearing and that by the word of God. And this is what delivers people from their sins. So in effect, the goal of a false teacher is to prevent people from coming to faith in Jesus Christ. That's their goal. Verse 19 continues, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. 
So the second point is no one has an excuse. God has revealed himself to every person through his creation. And these people refuse to acknowledge that. And if any person looks at creation and refuses to acknowledge the creator, then it's not because they don't have proof. It's because they have a hard-hearted obstinance and don't want to acknowledge the truth. Verses 21 through 23 go on to say, For they, though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were, heart, were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, and animals, and creeping things. So once again, God reveals himself to everyone. Ungodly people have a hard-hearted determination to deny the truth of God, and they refuse to give God the honor and thanks that he rightly deserves. They refuse to believe in him. They refuse to believe in his word, and that affects their ability to think. Their reasoning is distorted. Their mind doesn't work right. They think they're smart, and they think they're knowledgeable, but in truth, they're fools, and that in turn leads them to create gods in their own mind and fabricate things to worship. Mankind has always wanted to create their own gods. In Exodus 32, the Israelites made Aaron fabricate a, gaff, a calf of gold for them to worship. When Israel entered the promised land, they repeatedly worshiped the gods of the Canaanite people, and the Canaanites had plenty of gods to worship. They had Baal, which was their overall god. In fact, there were numerous Baals. They had Ashtoreth, which you read in scriptures about the Ashtoreth poles. This was the goddess Ashtoreth that they erected the poles to worship. They had Moloch, who was worshipped by sacrificing children. And I believe that still goes on today. They had gods for everything, weather, fertility, good fortune, war, everything you can imagine. They had a god for it that they worshipped in hopes that this false god would bring them fortune, good fortune. And the Israelites, whom the true God had delivered and blessed and fought for, who should have been, they should have been faithful to that one true God, they were constantly denying him and falling into idol worship. The book of Judges is nothing but a roller coaster ride of Israel's history of idolatry, God's restoration, and then they would just do it all over again, time and time again. They would worship idols, God would judge them, they would repent, and then they'd do it again. But it doesn't stop there. The Pharisees in Jesus' day had turned the truth of God into a works-based religion. Buddhism was created in the 6th century BC by Gautama Buddha. Islam was created in the 7th century AD by Muhammad. In the 1820s, Mormonism was created by Joseph Smith. Jehovah's Witness was created in the 1870s by Charles Taze Russell. And the prosperity theology came out of the New Thought Movement of the 1880s, created by Phineas Quimby. It goes on and on and on. Unregenerate people always fabricate things to worship. And always refuse to worship that one true God. That's what apostasy is. This is what ungodly people do. And false teachers lead that rebellion. The second thing that Jude tells us about false teachers is that they pervert the grace of God into sensuality. The false teachers that Jude was talking about were most likely the Gnostics. And the Gnostics were people who mixed philosophy and mysticism into a form of Christianity that produced false beliefs. A key element to Gnosticism is uh, dualism, which is the belief that everything that's spiritual is spiritual, everything that's physical is physical, that the spiritual is at odds with the physical, and the physical can do no good, and the spiritual is only good. And from that, uh, many, many Gnostics 
believed that what you did in your physical body was irrelevant. It had no merit. And so you could do whatever you wanted. It meant that you could sin all you wanted without any consequences or guilt. Once again, that still goes on today. So 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, and 4 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. So God has a commandment that we control our bodies. Sexual sin is not okay in God's. No sin is okay in God's sight. One of the main attractions to apostasy is that it allows you to be comfortable in your sin. If you're following someone who's allowing you to be comfortable in your own sin, you're following apostasy. That's not how God works. One of the biggest problems we have as humans is pride. We don't like to admit that we're depraved. We don't like to admit that, they're, that we're sinful. We like people to tell us that we're okay, and that's exactly what false teachers do. They tell you you're okay. They don't tell you that you need a savior. They don't preach about sin. And they certainly don't teach about repentance and forgiveness. But Jesus said in Luke 24, repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. So if you're following Christ, then repentance is a part of your life. Confession and repentance, without it, there is no remission for sin. So going back to Romans 1, in verse 24, it says, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. If you think that sexually transmitted diseases are not a penalty from God, well, I hope this shines a new light on it because it is. You need to understand that this part of Romans is describing a path. It is a path that the ungodly take, and it begins when they hard-heartedly refuse to acknowledge the one true God, and they continue in that behavior, and they're obstinate, and God systematically removes his sustaining hand from them, and they proceed down this path. First, their thinking becomes futile. They uh, then start to think of other things to worship and create other gods in their minds. And uh, then they either worship a false god or they try to worship the true god in a self-styled manner. Uh, Next, God turns them over to their own sin and lust. So God's wrath in this case is just to turn the person over to their sin. That's enough to destroy you. Your own sin will destroy you. And in this case, that's that's his wrath. He just turns you loose on your own sin. There's a real good example that is going on right now. If you look at what's happening in the Southern Baptist Convention and in the Hillsong Church, the sexual abuse claims are coming out of the woodwork and the churches are falling apart because of it. And it's because they've turned from the gospel of Jesus Christ and started to present a gospel that's appealing to men. So the word uh, used here for sensuality isn't altogether a bad description for this word because we are describing a determination to gratify your flesh. That's what it means. But the word that is used is the Greek word asogeia, And asylgeia is translated in other versions as licentiousness. And we don't use that word a lot these days, but it's a very strong word. And it basically implies the worst kind of shameless behavior imaginable. And what Paul is telling us in Romans is that that 
is what starts out as sin and lust becomes perverted sexual behavior and then homosexuality. And then in verse 28, he gives a list of their fruits. Now we know that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, and self-control against which there is no law. Well, this list is what I call the fruit of the flesh, and it starts in verse 28. And it says, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil content, co- covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedience to parents. We could uh, do a whole sermon on that one. Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things should die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. So not only do they wallow in their own sin, but they applaud and encourage sinful behavior. Um, You don't have to go very far today to see that in our own society. Everything that's bad, we're calling good. And everything that's good, we're calling bad. And we're applauding all the sinful things that are actually God's wrath being poured out on our society. And this can happen in an individual basis, but it can also happen to an entire society. And I believe that's what's going on with us. Um, We had a sexual revolution back in the 60s. By the 70s, it turned into a homosexual revolution. And now every sort of evil is called good. So when a person starts down this path of ungodliness, they have the potential to get continually worse and worse until they become the most vile, evil people imaginable. So when you ask why there's so much evil in our world right now, it's because people are on this path. They refuse to acknowledge God, and this is the outcome of that. Until they acknowledge God and surrender to his authority, they will continue down a path of self-destruction. And once again, that is apostasy, and this is what it produces. So the last triad in this set is... uh, that false teachers deny our only Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. We only have one Lord and Master, that is, Jesus Christ. But in Matthew 24, 5, Jesus said, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. The worst false teachers aren't the ones that teach that there is no God, or they teach a different God. The worst false teachers are the ones that teach a false Jesus Christ. They're the ones that pervert the gospel and lead people away from the true Jesus into a Jesus that's more acceptable, that's more um, to our liking. Um, At the end of the age, we know that there will be a false Christ, and that is the one that will lead the unregenerate world into God's wrath before Jesus returns. So that's why it's vital that we know Jesus Christ, the real Christ, the Christ of the Bible that God sent to pay for our sins, to pay for the sins of the world. But once again, the false teachers, they want to downplay that sin and they make people think that they don't need a savior. They deny Christ and they teach everything that the Bible says about him is false. They turn Jesus into an appealing character that pacifies us and meets our approval. We have to know the truth about Jesus Christ, and then we have to believe that truth. Earlier in verse 4, Jude told us that long ago these people were designated for this condemnation. Exactly what condemnation is Jude talking about? Well, the next triad tells us, starting in verse 5, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay with their own position of authority, 
but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and their surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So Jude's first example is from the book of Exodus, and he says that Jesus saved the people out of Egypt. If you remember, God brought the children of Israel out of bondage and slavery in Egypt, and then he was taking them to a land that he promised to them. And he guided them as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. In fact, when they were at the Red Sea and Pharaoh changed his mind and his army came after the Israelites to take them back into captivity, the pillar held Pharaoh and his, his soldiers back and opened up the Red Sea and allowed God's people to pass through on dry land. And then he allowed the sea to swallow up the Egyptians and kill them all. And the Israelites saw this with their own eyes, that that one true God, the God that they worship, did all those things to save them. And yet when they got to Canaan, the land that that same God had promised to them, they refused to believe that God was going to give it to them. Numbers 13 and 14 tells us that they sent out 12 spies to do a reconnaissance on that land and report back to the people. And even though they had seen God do so many things for them, they refused to believe that that God would deliver the land to them. And so God made them to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years until the whole generation died up except for two of the spies, the two that believed, Caleb and Joshua, the ones that believed God's promise and wanted to take the land. Everyone else died off. The second example is angels who did not stay with their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling. He has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So if you remember back in verse 5, Jude says, that he is reminding them, although they fully knew. So the story was familiar to Jude's audience. They knew what he was talking about. And that's probably because it was passed along through the Jewish oral tradition. We're not so familiar today, and the, the Bible doesn't really specifically say what he's talking about. But uh, if you look at... Um, 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And this is speaking of Satan. So if you think that this is Satan and his fallen angels, probably not. Satan is not locked away in the pit until the millennial kingdom in Revelation 20. Most likely what Jude is referring to is the angels in Genesis 6, 4, where it says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God, which always refers to angels, came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. This is most likely who Jude is talking about because if you look in the next example, it says, uh, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire which is an indication that these angels um, engaged in unnatural sex acts, things that were not natural to them. So that's a pretty good indication that this is the instance that he's talking about. But what's more important is that we understand that there were angels who didn't stay where God had put them, but left and did something that so angered God that he locked them up in chains and put them away until the day of judgment. So that's the point of this one. The third example is, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, served as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So this is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and I'm sure we all know it. It's well known. It's frequently referred to in Scripture. Scripture. 
It's mentioned in Ezekiel and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, uh, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. It's referred to in Romans and 2 Peter, and Jude brings it up here in this passage. Sodom and Gomorrah had walked the full length of that path that leads to destruction. They had walked the full length of the ungodly path. And God's, um, God's wrath went from leaving them to their own sin to him actually putting his hand against them and destroying them. And he let it rain fire and brimstone on them, which is a, an example of what hell is like. So the condemnation that Jude's talking about is that they wander in the lost while they're alive. And then when they die, they wait in chains and darkness until the day of the Lord. And then they're cast into eternal condemnation, which is hell for eternity. That is the end that's designated for false teachers. And any ungodly, anyone who rejects God will meet that same end. So a person might say, well, I thought God was a God of love. Why is he so hard on apostates and false teachers? Well, the answer is in John 3.16, which is probably the most popular, most quoted verse in the whole Bible. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God gave his son. We can't begin to understand how much God loves his son. And yet, he gave him for us because of our sins. John 17, 5 says, Jesus was in his place of glory, but he stepped down in obedience to his father who gave him to save us. So God has proven his love for us by giving his son. Jesus came to earth as a human. He was born like any other human, except his mother was still a virgin. Also, most human babies in that day were born in the house. Jesus was born in a barn. Most babies were laid in a crib. Jesus was laid in a feed trough. And the persecution of Jesus began immediately while he was still an infant because King Herod was jealous of him and tried to have him killed. Jesus went through infancy and childhood and his teenage years, became a young man, and at the age of 30, like all Jews at his time, became a full-grown man. He began a ministry, and he was surrounded by sinners, by beautiful, desirable women. One of them even poured oil on his feet and used her hair to wipe it off. By men who gave him complete authority over them, he was surrounded by thousands of people who he easily could have exploited and taken for financial gain or whatever he wanted. But in all of that, Jesus never sinned. He lived in a sin-laden world and never committed a single sin. And then one day his father allowed sinful men to make accusations against him for crimes that he did not commit. Evil men lied about him. They gave him a mock trial in a corrupt court. They hit him. They spit on him. They mocked him. They pulled his beer out by the roots. They turned him over to other evil men who beat him practically to death. In fact, they beat him so bad he couldn't even carry his cross. They found him guilty, and he hadn't done anything wrong, but they still found him guilty. And then they crucified him. Then to add to that, while he was hanging on that cross, his father took the sins of every person who would ever believe in him and heaped those sins on his shoulders. That son who never once sinned in his entire life suddenly had to bear the sins for millions of people, including you and me. And if that was not enough, that same father took his own wrath and his own anger for all those sins, and he poured it out on his son. And it crushed him to the point that that father had to hear his son cry out, my God, my God, 
Why have you forsaken me? And then he died, bearing all that sin and punishment so that no one ever again would need to suffer or pay for their own sins. That's what God did to prove his love for us. The question is, what do we do to prove our love for him? He asks us to believe in him. Apostates and apostates and false teachers call him a liar. He asks us to love him. But apostates love themselves more and refuse to love God. God wants us to really know him. And we do that by reading and studying his word. Jesus said this, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. The implication is, if you do not abide in his word, you're not his disciple. So we need to saturate ourselves with God's word. It needs to be inherent in our life that we study the Bible and read it and sit under good teaching and preaching so that we are not fooled by these false teachers. Apostates apostates make up their own gospel and only use God's word when they can exploit it and use it to manipulate people. He demands to rule and reign over our lives. Apostates want to be self-willed and do what they want and believe what they want and act how they want. And false teachers enable this behavior. God calls us to surrender our will and to be like his son, to be like Christ, So we need to ask ourselves, who do I love? Do I love God or not? Because that is really the only two choices we have. You either love the true God or you don't. Paul tells us in Ephesians, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. For us to think that God gave his only son, that his son went through such horrible pain and persecution, and in spite of that, we can choose to reject him is absolutely ridiculous. False teachers can make up a false god, and apostates, they believe in that fake god, And they are designated for that condemnation that Jude tells us about. They will wander around until they die. And then they'll be held in chains and bondage in a pit. And then they'll spend eternity in hell. Jesus said, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. We need to be his sheep. We need to know his voice so that he'll know us.